Welcome to the Fem Nation podcast, where we wholeheartedly believe women entrepreneurs can rise together. Success comes in many flavors. There are no secret strategies. Women entrepreneurs are rewriting history by defining success on their own terms. Hi, I'm White of Gannon, the down to earth chick with a different name. Entrepreneur and founder of the Female Entrepreneur Movement, our business is dedicated to helping women start and grow their businesses, increasing financial independence. Each week, join me for inspiring stories and powerful interviews of women entrepreneurs sharing their lessons to success to help you take your business to the next level. Now, let's go for it. Welcome back to the Fem Nation podcast. Today, I have the wonderful pleasure of getting to interview Allison Montfort. She's the founder and head chef for Inns and Stems, and I'm going to let her describe that what that is for you guys, you listeners. But uh, in the meantime, I want to thank her for being on the podcast, and I really appreciate her taking the time out to get to tell us about her entrepreneurial journey. Thank you, Allison. So excited for today. So let's start off with the big question first, and then we'll get into what you, what your business is. We'll, we'll get that midway. But I want to talk to you sure. first about the entrepreneurial journey. How did you come into being an entrepreneur? And did you actually know that that's what you were doing? I did know, yes. Um, I graduated college and had no idea what to do with myself. It felt like looking just off the cliff into the Grand Canyon. I had no idea. Um, so I just got a decent job, basically anyone that would hire me. And um, it was nice because I had a paycheck for a little while, which was, you know, it was kind of that first year where you're not paying for your education anymore and just um, trying to figure out what to do. Um, I spent a lot of my time buying ingredients and just cooking for fun. And um, I sat, I remember sitting at my desk and Googling what to do with your life. How do I know what <laughs> career path to take? And I was in a sales job, so I would answer the phone and, and try to sell people on, on what I was selling at the time. But all this time I was young and searching for something. And um, I would make all these to-do lists of, or or rather plus the pros and cons of things that I wanted in my career. And I really had the sense that um, the step that I took had to be the first in building a career. I didn't want to just go get another job. I wanted to do something that I could build on and keep learning. And, um, but cooking was my hobby. So I guess in a way I followed that age old advice of take your hobby and turn it into a career. And right around that time, the idea of being a personal chef was blowing up. There were a lot of people signing up for that. It was um, a growing um, industry and it just immediately made sense to me. I thought I could take my hobby. I can start a business. So I did go to culinary school, but always with the intention of starting a personal chef business. Um, and I did about less than a year later. Less than a year. That's awesome. Yeah, it's pretty so, quickly. So how, how has that journey been for you though, once you determined that that was going to be, you know, the path, the career path, what you wanted to do in your life? Yeah. Well, I had no idea what I was choosing, obviously. <laughs> so <laughs> I thought that seemed like a good first step. Um, that was almost 15 years ago. So wow. as I'm sure anybody listening can imagine, it has changed so many times and really drastically over the last 15 years. Um, I will say, I guess the one thing that has stayed true is that for um, all but eight months of the last 15 years, I have um, been working on my own business in one form or another. Um, I guess technically right now I'm running my third business. Depend it depends on how you count a little bit. Sure. A few of them have overlapped. Um, but um, yeah, it's changed a lot. I mean, I've been everything from a solopreneur where it's just me and I do everything to running a team of 18 other people. Um, I've worked in people's homes. I've had a cafe. I've you know made money in various ways, everything from consulting to actually, you know, being a literal cater waiter and handing out canapes to fancy crowds and politicians. Wow. Um, so it has changed a lot over the years. I've learned so much. Um, you know, I think it's really true. You don't know what you don't know. And sure. I actually think in, um, maybe in a lot of other areas too, but specifically in, um, an entrepreneurial journey, it's almost easier for me to move forward when I'm not sure what I don't know. Um, I think it gives you a sense of bravery. And as long as you're willing to learn along the way and, 
Um, and to build on that, I've never found that to be a hindrance, but it does make me feel braver. If I had to go back and do everything over from the beginning, knowing what I know now, I actually think I would be a lot more hesitant or nervous about being able to pull some of these things off. I love that bravery. Yes. And I think there is just kind of a bit of the unknown factor that allows yeah. entrepreneurs to, to continue to move forward. Otherwise, yeah, we would analyze the crap out of it and be like, eh, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it just seems so hard um, if you know how hard it is. Right. So yes. I do think you need the combination of, of not knowing and being really optimistic mystic, but also willing to learn because, you know, you can't just go blindly forward without continuing to learn and evolve sure. and grow. That would be obviously a disaster. <laughs> um, True. So, but that combination is sort of the, the sweet spot. And I think I've, um, I've stayed curious and really open-minded. Um, I like whenever, you know, like mentorships or, um, the opportunity to be a mentee comes up because I really do feel at, you know, this midlife point, this mid career point, um, I can be both a mentor and a mentee. There's yes. plenty that I do know. And I love talking to younger chefs who are up and coming and getting their business started. And sometimes it's like, how do I get my business license? Or, you know, um, when do I talk to an accountant? And some of these things that you do learn at the beginning, but then what I'm doing now is like, do I need an investor and what is a term sheet and how do I, you know, grow to have half a million views to my webpage and some of these other questions where I need help from somebody who's been there before. So um, it's a pretty enjoyable place to be um, in a lot of ways. Do you feel like entrepreneurship is, is basically lifelong learning? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's my favorite thing about it. Truly. I do. Um, I have, and you can learn from anywhere um, if you're open to it. Uh, recently, and actually how I met you was through a Facebook group. So not just general Facebook, but Facebook groups. And I'm finding that as I'm participating with people from around the country, um, I'm making friends from uh, around the world, really. Yes. And, and am able to learn from them even when... Um, I, I, I least expect it or, you know, even if, if that wasn't what I set out to do, there's just always opportunities to kind of grow and pivot and learn and, um, and develop yourself and your business. And that, that's what keeps me interested. And I, you know, I referenced the eight months when I, when I did work for somebody else in between selling my largest business and starting what I do now. Uh -huh. And, um, I just felt very trapped kind of being in the same place all the time. I worked on only a slice of what the larger company did and it just wasn't engaging enough for me. I like kind of working on all the things. It's hard to go between the two for sure. You kind of have to pick one or the other and, and it's passion based, you know, I mean, there's definitely hurdles and hills to climb being an entrepreneur, but the rewards are amazing. But there's also, you know, hills and hurdles to climb in a career based environment working for someone and that it has its rewards too. But I definitely agree with that. In, in doing the, in doing your entrepreneur journey and building your businesses, what would you say is one of the common elements that you had to overcome in order to continue to move forward? Um, I've always been bootstrapped, so I've never felt like there was just a, you know, a bank account where I could experiment or take huge financial risks unless I was pretty sure that there would be some amount of payout. So whatever the business has been, that's always been a consideration. And a lot of times I feel frustrated by that and think that it's a constraint. For instance, right now I'm considering Facebook ads or Pinterest ads or Google ads or something else. And I can't try them all. Um, right. I have to really consider where my audience is and which will give me the best return. And do I want to use ad A or ad B? And, you know, do I want to um, advertise to all of California or all of the world? And really have to make those decisions. So a weakness of mine is feeling limited by that, even though I know that, um, with more money doesn't necessarily come solutions. It can just be harder right. and more expensive. Um, so I personally struggle always with reminding myself that sometimes um, um, valuing every penny because I've earned it um, is actually a benefit. And even though I might grow more slowly, I can grow a little more intentionally and it's really, really meaningful. 
Um, so that has been a consistent, I would say, in, in any type of business that I've had or um, anywhere you know, that I've, I've put something out there. That's always a personal struggle of mine, and it is a, um, a constant in my businesses that I have to be very slow-growing and intentional to get there. Um, but the so I'm actually glad you brought up the fact that um, bootstrapping has been really kind of part of the backbone of your business because it hasn't been a topic yet on the podcast here. But so many entrepreneurs, so many women entrepreneurs, actually start out in the bootstrapping business or in the bootstrapping their business because we almost get into businesses by able by being able to move into them and work into them and you know it kind of runs in with our timeline of our life and whatever else is going on there but bootstrapping is extremely important because i think a lot of uh, entrepreneurs in general uh, undervalue how you can actually move from one place to another by simply bootstrapping it and yes it's a little slower on the growth potentially but as you said, the value is a little bit deeper and um, you're, because you make the money and you choose how to spend the money. And so with that, do you feel like that hindered your growth to where you want to go significantly? Or do you feel like that it was in line with when you, what you needed to learn when you needed to learn it? Um, you know, both. I think traditionally, I agree with everything you say. And I think traditionally, um, women have been a little more cautious. And um, we're still seeing today how few um, or, or what a small percent of the, the investment dollars are going to female run businesses. Don't Even get me started I do feel on like, that topic. <laughs> I know. I feel like the, the momentum and the conversation around it is starting to move. But we've seen over the last couple of years that the the actual numbers are not changing. So right. hopefully that will start changing with the conversation. But I do think it's really powerful in the meantime that so many women are starting businesses and the way that they have to do it is by bootstrapping. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do think depending on who you surround yourself with, the idea of being a slower, smaller bootstrap business Business, um, is maybe not as glamorous. You're not going to be a unicorn or, you know, ring the NASDAQ bell or any of that stuff. It might take a little longer, but plenty of women do make it that way. Um, you know, Sarah Blakely who did Spanx is one of my favorites. She bootstrapped that thing to, it, it's, her story is just so impressive and there are tons of others that you can find as well. Um, so I, um, I think that it did always having to be really thoughtful about how I spent my money did make me feel in control of things. Really. Um, I never felt like I had any outside pressure to grow any faster than I wanted to, or was able to handle at that time, especially as somebody who started relatively young and had to learn a lot as I was going. Um, I do think the lack of investment always, um, just kind of kept me at the right pace with with the business that I was running and you know with what I could afford to do as well. I will say my first business which I ran for about 10 years and then sold did ultimately reach a point where I couldn't take it to the next level. And I do think now only in hindsight I didn't know this at the time or I was less aware. But in hindsight I do think that money would have gotten me to the next level. Basically. Um, I had a cafe and a, a catering company and I was in a location that didn't fit with my revenue and we were just kind of constrained by our space. And I was getting requests to cater larger jobs that I needed more space to do and I needed more equipment, but I didn't have the money. The business was doing okay. Um, in terms of keeping everybody afloat and running and paying for itself, we were profitable, but I couldn't move to a larger space. I didn't have enough saved up to kind of invest in the future of it. And um, I also was extremely burnt out by that point. So I decided to sell it rather than figure that out. But now looking back on it, I see that another option to continue growing that business would have been money. And I would have needed somebody else's money to get there. So I guess in that way, it's an example of a time where it, it may have held me back. That said, at this moment, which is now, what, three and a half years later, I'm so glad I'm not doing that business anymore. Sure. I'm grateful for it all the time. Selling it was the right move. So, um, you know, I suppose from that example, you could also say not having a lot of extra money led me to what I'm doing now, which I'm far more passionate about and is in line with what I want to do for the next 10 years. So... 
and possibly could have prevented a major, major amount of burnout. You know, I mean, exactly. you were because you say you were burning out, but if you continued or had the opportunity to invest more money and continue to keep going, you probably would have hit a brick wall and maybe the business that you have now quite possibly would not have existed. Exactly. Exactly. Is, I mean, so everything works in its own timing. I, you know, I mean, it, it's cliche to say that I get it, but it really in hindsight did work out the right way, but it could have been a different way. And the, the main factor was the money. Right. Yeah, definitely. So, um, yeah, I, I, have, I have no regrets about it. I, f- I feel great about it, but I do think it's it's possibly an example of somewhere that, you know, I had a nice little business and, and a lot of support. I had plenty of customers and opportunity for growth, but it was a lack of money that prevented that next step. So for better or worse. Do you feel like um, women who bootstrap and start from pre- pretty much maybe just a... Um an idea and build that concept up through time and through bootstrapping the business that maybe they undervalue the fact that they have a business and it's not just a hobby. I think so. Yeah, I do. Um, definitely. And I've, I've seen that, you know, I'm in, I have two kids, I'm in a mom's group on Facebook and I see a lot of, you know, mom owned businesses and a lot of conversation around what is a business, what isn't a business. Um, there's a lot of, um, mud thrown at moms who are running MLM type businesses and are those legit or aren't they, um, do they count? Um, so there's a lot of conversation like that. I mostly think um, that, you know, if you're putting something out there, a product, whether it's a tangible product or consulting for somebody or you're an assistant to somebody, if you're, you know, putting something out there and your paycheck is coming through you um, and you're, you're receiving income for it, I think that's a business. Um, Absolutely. I, and it's, there's value I to agree. that for sure. I 150% agree with that. And I do believe though, that we are somewhat conditioned to feel like maybe that isn't, you know, a viable business or can't be perceived as such because it sits over here and it's, you know, while they dual time or split time with something else in their life, or they're just getting their feet wet and they don't quite know what to do. But I do believe that is, that is highly, highly, highly undervalued, no matter what they go into, how they go into business. If you are generating money and you are changing your life, your family's life, your community's life, your client's life, somehow you are in business and absolutely need to recognize that for the sheer fact that girl, you went out and you did it. You're lapping absolutely. everybody else sitting on the couch. And you can see so many bloggers are an example that immediately come to mind where um, the woman started some sort of blog. There was value. They started seeing money and then her partner ends up quitting and following her around town with a camera or (laughs) taking pictures to support this business that you can see started as a, you know, quote unquote, like stereotypical female hobby of cooking or baking or fashion. And suddenly there are these huge fashion bloggers or you know, these people that make legitimate businesses out of like taking photographs of their funny looking pet. And now it's this whole family business, but it started from this very traditionally viewed as like feminine hobby. Um, and they're just amazing stories or, um, Carol's daughter is like a makeup company and she started just mixing potions basically in her kitchen and selling them. And it took over her whole house and her whole family. And, um, she's wildly successful and, it's, I love founder stories like that where they have found that value and grown it. Yes. And they really followed a passion and, you know, maybe they didn't realize it at first, but it, what it is a business. And, and I do believe the entrepreneurial space needs to come aboard and recognize that a lot of those are businesses. And I think there's a disconnect between, um, old school entrepreneur and, um, this, this new generation of entrepreneur, not generation age wise, but this new timing of entrepreneurism because it is different and it is, and that's what makes it unique and it can be bootstrapped and it can be lucrative and it can do so many different things, but there's a whole subsect of, of entrepreneurs that just don't believe that that is, um, a viable business or that, oh, that's a fluke and it's going to fall apart in a year. 
Definitely. And there's so many ways to get your product out there now. So, so um, anyone can do it. We, you know, we all have the tools, um, you know, two examples like in music, Billie Eilish or Lil Nas X yes. who have these hit records and they just started putting videos on YouTube and anyone with a product and a passion and something to say can do that. And, you know, if you, if you give it enough and you're savvy and, and kind of follow that path, who knows where that could lead. I think that's really exciting. It's fun. It's a fun time to be an entrepreneur for sure. Let's circle it back around to your business. What do you, what did you morph your business into now? What does that look like? So it, basically I'm asking what is ins and stems? Absolutely. Subscription site. So we are a meal planning platform that helps home cooks reduce their household food waste. Whoa. I've been a chef. I'm still a chef. I still write recipes. The difference is um, I don't produce the food. So I give people the tools to figure out what they're going to cook this week, scale their recipes very simply, generate a grocery list. And then I have all various tips and tricks baked into it so that you maximize the, the um, ingredients that you buy. So you have less waste and you save money. When I sold the last business and was trying to figure out what to do, you know, I was still in food. I, I loved being a chef. That wasn't going away. But I, I started talking to people and I interviewed 1,000 families about their biggest culinary concerns and their struggles. And it, unsurprisingly, it always comes back to what are we having for dinner tonight, right? That's everyone feels that yeah. struggle. The question um, of the day. And my goal was to solve it in a, a more environmentally friendly way. Right around 2015, 2016, it started coming out about the huge impact that our food industry has on the planet, a negative impact. So in the food industry, we have um, the influence and the power to really make big changes if we all make small individual changes. So in trying to empower and educate home cooks, to cook better for the planet, they told me, pretty overwhelmingly so, that first I had to help them decide what was for dinner tonight, and then after that, they would have time to try to do it in a more environmentally friendly way. So menu planning and telling people what to cook, recommending um, recipes for them that fit together to use up all their perishables and allow them to buy less and eat more of what they buy um, helps people effortlessly reduce their household food waste because they don't really have to think about it. All they have to do is tell me a little bit about what they do and don't like to eat. They pop onto the website. It's really inexpensive. It's like $2 a week. So it's not like you're, you're just paying for you know, a couple of recipes and for access. And so you don't have advertisements. Um, while you're trying to look up the recipes. But specifically, the, I think what is valuable to people is that, that emotional burden of also figuring out, oh, what should we buy at the grocery store? And what are we going to cook it into? And, you know, somebody likes tacos, but do we have tortillas? And trying to remember all those things. Um, I've done all that work for you. So all you have to do is approve your meal plan and cook along, and you'll see that you're reducing your carbon footprint by reducing your food waste. And that's what fascinates me. I'm kind of a foodie myself. And that I really fascinate, fascinates me about your business is reducing, calling to mind and putting it in front focus that you're reducing the food waste because we, especially in the United States, we waste a tremendous amount of food, tremendous. And I mean, we could feed other countries with the amount of food that we throw away. And with our regulation system, it's gotten so burdened rightfully so to some degree, but that's a whole different topic, but it's gotten so burdened with what actually can be done or can't be done with food that ends up in a landfill that, you know, it, it, that don't get me started on that piece because I yeah. have a whole thought process of well, what's going on with there, but I can't fix that at the moment. Um, here's the stat. Here's the stat that I really like that speaks to that in you know, in another 10, 15 years, we're going to add another billion and then eventually um, 2 billion extra people to the planet. We already produce enough food to feed all of them. Holy crap. So in barely 2020, we already produce enough food to feed the population of 2040. But because globally we waste 30%, in the US we waste 40% we won't have enough to feed anybody because we're growing it. You use up the water, you use the yep. gas, you use the land and all these Oil other resources nutrients. and growing it. Yeah. And then we just throw it away. So it's not sustainable for the, the future population. Um, and if that doesn't get you interested in it, 
one in eight Americans is food insecure. So they don't have enough food to eat. They yes. don't know where their next meal is going to come from. And if that doesn't get you interested in finding a solution, the average family of four in the United States throws away a pound of food a day, which equals almost $2,000 per year per family of four. So almost everybody, if they don't care about all three, almost everybody either cares about literally our future ability to survive on the planet, the fact that other people are starving, or how much money gets wasted. So one of those entry points has to get people interested in it. And when really the solution is just, well, part of the solution, certainly, um, your part that you can do right now without spending any extra money is just paying a little more attention to what you bring into your house, what you already have, and then you know people need um, technology and people need um, guidance and education on how to use up the food that they already have to show that they value it. So that's really the piece that I'm trying to solve for people to make it fun and easy and rewarding rather than like when you hear about, you know, so many problems that we're facing in the world today, it's, you could be paralyzed. It's overwhelming True. the need to act and not knowing where to spend your money or where to spend your time to start making the world a better place. I propose that reducing your own household food waste is a very easy place to get started and it doesn't cost you any extra money to start. And and it's a movement, right? I mean, it's, yep. sometimes we look at the bigger picture and we're like, I'm just one person. What difference can I make? But the thing is, it's collectively, if we all think that way, we all continue to circulate the same problem. But if we start moving our thought process to, I am exactly. one person, I can make a difference, then start going forward that way. But And, and exactly. that goes for many, I mean, that goes for all kinds of issues that could be solved around the world at this point in time with that kind of thought process. But in speaking just to food itself, that is such a resource that we so easily, especially in the United States, take for granted. Because Definitely. we... we generalize that because we have access to a lot of food that everybody must have access to a lot of food and they don't exactly. need the help, which even in our own country though, we don't one in eight, you said one in eight doesn't, in have, eight. Yeah. doesn't have enough food, you know? Yep. So we overlook that even could be somebody standing right next to us, yep. their kids or the, I, I do know for a fact that my kids in school, they tell me they pack something extra, usually almost on a daily basis because so-and-so or so-and-so didn't have a enough lunch or didn't have a lunch or, you know, was still hungry, you know? And so, I mean, we do that, um, because they feel compelled to do it. And I validate that all day long, but even right here, even right here, we still have issues that we overlook and yet so much gets thrown away. Gosh. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> and when we go into our grocery stores, you know, you see an abundance and you see towering racks yes. of apples and bell peppers. So it feels like, um, you know, if you can afford to throw away a dollar fifty apple, you can get more so easily. Right. Um, you know, it and the truth is much larger than that. Even though there is an abundance at the grocery store, um, there isn't when you look at the bigger picture of things. Uh one of my favorite parts on my um my website is an impact report. So each week when you sign in, it will show you how many kilograms of greenhouse gases you are estimated to have saved from the atmosphere by reducing your food waste with my ends and stems method. But because kilograms of greenhouse gases is very intangible, that does not elicit much feeling from people, we have then converted that into slices of pizza and we show you how many estimated slices of pizza you have personally saved, but then we show the community impact right next to it. So we take all of the subscribers from all over the country. I have subscribers in the country. I actually have one in Canada and one in Spain and one in Costa Rica. So I'm international now. <laughs> but it shows that community impact so that even if your liberal next door neighbor is not paying attention, you can sign on every day when you look up your next recipe and see that there is a virtual community who cares. And we're at, last time I checked, we were at 74,000 slices of pizza that just since my site launched um, this summer have been saved from wasting away in our landfills. So it adds up so quickly. Oh my gosh, you are my new hero. <laughs> I love that. Oh my word. Okay, so if that alone, the pizza slices being saved, isn't intriguing, if the, if, if the stats weren't intriguing and the pizza didn't grab you, I'm not sure we can be friends. 
<laughs> you know, for anybody that's listening, I'm like, oh my gosh, how could you not want to know this information? We are, we are making an impact in the world. One interview at a time, one slice of pizza at a time, and we are going to move it forward. And Allison, it is so amazing the thought that you put into this because I truly want to make sure that my family continues to make the impact. So I appreciate the work that you have done and the awareness that you bring to it. And it almost is kind of a ripple effect because then it, it pulls back the kind of the cloudy layer of vision that we have. And then we can see so many other things that we can make an impact on. If we could take one step, even, you know, how we can reduce the carbon footprint by what we consume and what we create for meals. Holy crap. Then all of a sudden we're like, we, we did that. So let's go make an impact somewhere else. And let's, you know, I mean, it's just a ripple effect of continuing to move forward. That's exactly the feeling that I want people to have. Here's the easiest place to start. And then that once that you do that and that feels good and your family sees that impact, then you're able to start building up and do a little bit more. Because in all honesty, to say, stop climate change, save the planet, we do need bigger changes. We need systemic changes. We need yep. you know huge overarching things to happen. But those things don't happen on a government level if individually we don't also take little actions to show that it matters and that we care. So um, that's exactly the feeling that I want people to come away with. I am so ecstatic that we were connected. I'm glad that, yeah, I mean, and, and go figure through, I mean, never having known who each other were to being able to connect inside of a social media platform to be able to, you know, find out the impact that individually we are wanting to make our big, you know, audacious goals of what we want to contribute to as we move through life. I am super in awe at what you've created and I love every ounce of what you've done. So thank you. Thank you. But, and oh, go to, ahead. To, tie, to tie it back to what we were saying before too, I do, you know, this is an entrepreneurial journey podcast. I will say, you know, sometimes it's just me. I run this business by myself yep. and I sit here and I test and write recipes and I post them online and it's sort of like sending them off into the atmosphere. And I wonder, you know, does it matter? Is anyone going to cook this? Does this have an impact? You know, who am I connected to and what am I working towards? And um, I think, you know, when I, when I connect with people like you and, and, you know, I imagine lots of people in the audience who are listening, when I hear that, you know, even just one person cooked with the leaves of the Brussels sprouts that fell off while they were chopping them, or they made chicken stock with the bones they had left over. Um, it's all of those little moments that on this sort of slow growing bootstrap journey where I'm at right now, um, each of those things stack up and just make me feel um, more confident and like I matter. And it gives me the courage to kind of continue on this too. And so. that, that should be encouraging for listeners and anybody that feels like they're just one person and not sure if what they dream and aspire to build and create for a business is actually doable, or maybe they need more people, or maybe they need more money. And no, you know what? Start right where you at yeah. and embrace where you are and just move forward because more people and more money may not be the answer for you bringing your vision to life and actually making right. an impact and feeling that deep, you know, that, that sense of making a difference, you know, you can do it one person at a time. It just takes it. So move forward, absolutely move forward. Yep. Definitely. And we're not alone anymore with the ways it's so easy to connect, you know, put yes. yourself out there a little bit. And, um, it's, I, it's one of my favorite things to do is connect with other entrepreneurs and change makers and people who are building things. Um, it gets you outside your your physical community and to be in a community of others who are doing the same thing and really understand what you're going through. I think that's that support system is really, really important. And uh, with a connection to the internet, that's pretty much free nowadays. It's a new ball game with that. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so Allison, tell me real quick and tell the listeners, if you don't mind, where can they find you? Um, anywhere there is to be found online at ends and stems. So it's spelled out E N D S A N D S T E M S. And so ends and stems.com on Instagram, Facebook at ends and stems. That's so cool. And definitely we will have your information in the show notes. So please check out the show notes because it is worth your while to start making a difference by even the carbon footprint, but more importantly, move forward with your entrepreneurial journey, even if it's just you, because it is so doable and the impact will be felt for generations. All right, guys, wrapping it up there. Thank you so much, Allison, for coming on the show. 
this has been amazing and truly eye-opening for me and makes me want to go see, you know, how many pizza slices can I save? <laughs> I, I was check stuck your on the produce drawer <laughs> and make dinner tonight. Thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun and um, um, I'm proud to be a part of your community. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, check out the show notes and as always, keep moving forward. Thanks for listening to the Fem Nation podcast. Be sure to check out our show notes for more details from the episode. If you love the show, share it with a friend or drop me a note. I'd love to hear from you over at whitedovegannon.com or find me on social media. Until next time, keep moving forward. 